Welcome everyone to another exciting Wednesday evening here at York Observatory. You are on York Observatory YouTube or Teletube as we like to call it, the online astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. This is Professor Elena Hyde and I am here this evening with an absolutely fabulous crew. I have with me tonight Quentin, Ovada, Shannon, and of course, a special guest interview from Professor Deborah Harris. We are broadcasting live this evening from the Allen I. Carswell Observatory located at York University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And just as a reminder for folks, as we get started here uh, with our interview with Professor Deborah Harris, we do broadcast every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. live on this channel on YouTube. If you miss our broadcast or you want to catch some of our old episodes, they are in fact recorded. So you can find them under playlists live stream on this channel. So you'll be able to see uh, all of our previous episodes, but if you have questions or comments for us or our team, or even suggestions, you can always reach out at observe at yorku.ca and of course on Twitter or Instagram at York Observatory. So as we get started this evening, I have a special announcement. So in, in addition to having a guest with us uh, for an interview, who is going to tell us some really fascinating things about some fascinating particles, we are actually privileged to be able to start off our show with a little bit of live observing as well. Um, so Professor Harris is going to be here with us as we hop over to the one meter telescope. Um, now I'm just setting up the one meter telescope right now. So if I switch over to that image, you can see here we go. So this is the images coming in live at this moment from the One Meter Telescope at campus. We are looking at the moon. Um, so it is absolutely lovely tonight. The sun just set, so you get some really beautiful images of the moon. Uh, if you have a chance to go outside and look here in Toronto, the skies are very, very clear. You won't get quite a good of view, as good a view of this though. So we have um, some pictures of the moon coming in. Obviously, this won't look like the moon you see in the sky because this is, um, you know, zoomed in quite a bit. So we're able to see a lot of detail with the one meter telescope. You can see we're actually at the terminator line. That's the line between the, the light and the shadow of the moon. Right now, the moon is is gradually getting more and more illuminated, or as we like to say sometimes in astronomy, it's, it's waxing. And it'll keep doing this until it's all the way full again. Now, I'd just like to give a little shout out as well, because in October, um, the moon is obviously going to go through a whole new set of phases, but it's going to do this right next to a very, very bright Mars. So if you see a super bright red star, um, the next few days, that is going to be, uh, or nights I should say, that is going to be the planet Mars getting brighter and brighter until it's at opposition. So just for any listeners um, or curious folks, we are actually going to be doing a whole host of extra events, extra teletubes on the 3rd, the 6th, the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, and 15th of October, just to catch you the most possible uh, images of the opposition of Mars, which is the brightest it's been since uh, about 2003, and the brightest it's going to be for quite a while. So we're going to be able to get some really fabulous images um, you know, of Mars, and actually on the 3rd, it will be extremely close to the moon as well. So interesting conjunctions happening. Uh, we're obviously aiming for a Mars opposition and the moon is you know, always a key player in, in our skies. So I'll just give a, a, an extra little uh, second here if any of our, our, chat, our crew on tonight has a favorite moon fact. And while everyone's thinking, I'm just going to move a little bit um, our position was relative to the moon. Shannon? Hello, everyone. Um, as I want to quick fact, um, did you know you weigh less on the moon? Um, so because the moon is much smaller than Earth, because um, it's smaller mass, it actually has uh, less, a weaker gravity, pretty much. So you will actually be one sixth of your weight on the moon than you are on Earth. Um, so if you want a quick diet, you can go onto the moon. <laughs> 
Excellent. That is quite true. And if you went into be the next best uh, basketball player, um, the moon would also be a, a very, very good location. Um, so if you're thinking of taking up any any sort of very vigorous sports, um, the moon is a, a great place to be. Of course, you would need a spacesuit and um, probably quite a bit of equipment as well. So as you can just see in here in the image, I am shifting our position slightly. Um, as we as we go across, you can get a little bit more image of the uh, um, the edge of the moon as well, just showing some of those dark and light areas, the Mara, and of course the beautiful cratering visible on on the moon here. All right, folks, I hope you have enjoyed our live images from the telescope. Um, if you hear strange noises behind me, that is actually our 60 centimeter, which is hard at work doing research at the moment. But um, I think it is about time that we went ahead and got started with our regular scheduled program. So as I mentioned before, we do have a fabulous interview uh, um, scheduled up for you, or shall I say slated for tonight. Um, and we have a whole host of interesting questions which we're going to discuss with, uh, with Professor Harris. But before we get there, uh, Quentin, would you give us a, a quick overview? Good evening, everyone. I'm Quentin, and I'm here with Professor Hyde, Shannon, and Obata. And we're here from the Allen I. Carsville Observatory at York University. Tonight, we've got a great interview with the amazing Professor Deborah Harris. Indeed. And of course, I am also scheduled to give a little bit of a, an introduction here. So I'm not sure that I will be able to, uh, uh, to do it justice, but I'll certainly try. Um, Professor Harris, as uh, you know, uh, uh, we're actually very lucky to have her here at York. And, you know, it's uh, basically, as they like to say, you know, the search for answers to really complex questions about the origins of the universe um, actually got a huge boost here in, uh, for us in 2019 when uh, Professor Harris was appointed to lead York University's participation in the Fermilab hosted Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment or DUNE. So this is actually a partnership between York University's Faculty of Science and Fermilab. And more importantly, it meant that Professor Harris joined us here at York. So very exciting times uh, for everyone. And Professor Harris is a senior scientist at Fermilab and a leader in the study of atomic particles called neutrinos, sorry, subatomic particles called neutrinos. And she led the construction of Minerva, which is uh, one of the neutrino detectors we'll be talking about at Fermilab. She's a co-leader of the experiment's scientific collaboration since 2010. And she's also a member of the DUNE team, which you will hear a little bit more about today as well. So she collaborates with people all around the world in uh, you know, advancing the study of neutrinos. These tiny particles are the most abundant in the universe, but are very poorly understood. They could answer some of the biggest questions in physics, um, you know, with time and maybe a bit of help from Professor Harris. So Dune um, is, is one of the uh, uh, experiments that we're going to talk about today, so I won't spoil it too much, but it will send the world's most intense beam of high energy neutrinos through the Earth from Fermilab over to a, a detector. I believe it's in South Dakota, but I, <laughs> I won't do too many spoilers here. <laughs> and uh, it, it, is, it is a giant collaboration from scientists and engineers around the globe. And it has been said that Dune could unlock the mystery of why matter and the universe exist. So, of course, no pressure. And of course, a big thank you to Professor Harris for joining us tonight. Um, you want to say a quick hello, Professor? Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to everybody. Wonderful. Well, we are absolutely thrilled to have you and we have some uh, questions prepared for you, um, uh, you know, from our from our students here. So I'm actually going to hand off to Quentin for our first question for you tonight. Uh, thank you once again. For being here tonight, Professor Harris. Uh, my question is about neutrinos. So your research involves some of the smallest and most elusive objects known to physics, neutrinos. Can you tell our audience a bit more about these strange particles? Sure. So the way I think about uh, defining neutrinos, you know, in an elevator speech is they, they are made whenever uh, different particles come together, like nuclei come together 
they, they will produce neutrinos. So for example, inside the sun, protons hit each other and become, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> protons hit each other and become H2 and then they, that makes a neutrino. And then the, um, and you know, the process keeps going and that's how, you know, the periodic table of the elements is built because, you know, particles come together and make heavier and heavier nuclei, but they also make neutrinos. So that's one way you can make neutrinos. Another way the neutrinos are made is when nuclei break apart. So for example, in nuclear reactors, um, you know, you start with uranium and that uranium will decay. And in the chain of decay products, neutrinos are also created. So basically anytime there's an unstable particle that decays through the weak interaction, neutrinos are made. And that's why there are so many of them because the particles that decay weakly decay still pretty quickly. And so there, and neutrinos, as far as we know, live forever, unless they interact. So um, in fact, if you think about the, the way people think the universe began, there was a huge amount of energy in a small space and this created a huge number of particles that were produced. And those particles after the Big Bang decayed into neutrinos and neutrinos as you'll hear many, many times tonight, almost never interact. So the neutrinos that were made at, right after the Big Bang from all these particles decaying are still around us. And um, so that was about, so if you could see those neutrinos, you would have a window into what was going on in the universe one second after the Big Bang. So people are working hard to try and figure out how to see those neutrinos. But my research is focused on uh, much higher energy neutrinos. So you might wonder, I said, oh, neutrinos never die. So they never decay, but they do interact with other materials. And that's, that's how we can see them. So they, are, they only feel the weak force. So that means that they can only interact using what we call the weak force carriers, which are either the W particle or the Z particle. And um, I just show here those two different kinds of reactions where you could have a neutrino that interacts with a nucleus or an electron and then create an electron if it's if it's an electron flavored neutrino in the first place or a neutrino could just bounce off another particle and just give some energy to that other particle so those are the ways that neutrinos go and there are actually three different kinds of neutrinos or at least three and the three different neutrinos that we know about correspond to the three different generations of fundamental particles that we think we understand. So we know that there are, everybody's heard of electrons, but there are also heavier uh, cousins, if you like, or, or siblings of the electron. So there's the muon and then there's the tau. So those are three particles that act very similarly, except they have very different masses. And so there are neutrinos that correspond to each of those charged particles, which, um, in fact, when the standard model, when, when neutrinos were predicted to exist, they were predicted to have you know, no mass. There's no, the weak interaction requires these neutrinos to not weigh anything. So anyway, the neutrinos come in three flavors, just like these charged particles come in three, these charged electron-like particles come in three flavors. And so uh, we see neutrinos because we can see these electrons coming out after they hit a nucleus, or sometimes you can see uh, another particle that got kicked out of the nucleus. The only thing that makes this hard is that that almost never happens. And so um, I was saying, so I, I am ex an experimentalist, so I'm not going to believe anything until I see it. And uh, so I'm going to talk about, there are three different experiments that I'm working on now. And so that means that there are at least three different ways of seeing neutrinos. And so the first way I'll show you that you can see a neutrino is, um, so a neutrino has no charge, but if it hits a nucleus, it can turn into either an electron or a muon or even a, a tau, and that particle is charged. So if you give that particle enough energy, it will go through your detector. And muons in particular can go through a lot of detector. So if you see, so in, this is a picture of a real event from the Minerva experiment, and there's a beam of neutrinos. It's hard to, you can't tell, but there are millions of neutrinos passing through the detector at this very instant in time. And one of them 
blew up, a, you know, kicked a couple of particles out of a nucleus and also a couple of charged particles. That's what these two lines are from. And then that neutrino turned into a muon, which goes a very long distance in the detector. This whole distance is about five meters across. So if you can picture this, this particle that weighs almost nothing, but has a huge amount of energy, and it can make this muon that goes across five meters of plastic and steel and lead. So, um, but that's only one of many ways to see a neutrino. Um, so another way you could make a, a, a detector to see neutrinos, and this is from the one of the detectors at the T2K experiment, this detector also is very close to where the neutrinos got produced. And in this case, the, the neutrinos also are interacting in um, a material where they make charged particles and the detector can see the charged particles. And in this case, you see that the tracks that those charged particles make actually are bending. So what that means is that this detector has a magnetic field. So it can measure not only the, the particles that come out when a neutrino hits a nucleus, but also it can measure the charge of those particles because you see which way these tracks curve in a magnetic field. And then finally, um, another the, the last experiment I'm gonna talk about today is the Dune experiment. And that detector um, is going to be made out of liquid argon. But again, it's instrumented in such a way that you can see a signal when a charged particle gets created. So again, you have a neutrino beam coming from the left, and this time it came all the way from Fermilab, but um, it breaks apart a nucleus, or at least it kicks out a proton, for example, and an electron in this case. And this is what an electron looks like as it passes through all this liquid argon. And then this is what a proton looks like. But you, it's, it's just such a weird thing because there's nothing, and then you see charged particles coming out. It sort of makes no sense, but that's, that's what neutrinos, that's how you can tell you've seen a neutrino. That's awesome. And of course, you know, um, having things not make sense is always a wonderful way to, to start off any scientific inquiry. Um, now, I, I think this is a, a, a good introduction for a lot of folks as well, seeing a little bit of um, a different kind of observational astronomy than, uh, than what you might get normally. Now, I think we're, we'll go ahead and, and move on to our next question, which is going to be from Shannon. Um, you're currently active on three different neutrino experiments. Which is your favorite and why? Um, well, that's a really, it's like asking a parent, you know, which child is your favorite? I, I don't have a favorite. <laughs> uh, they're all three different. I, I like them for very different reasons. Uh, Minerva is an experiment that I was on at the very beginning and I oversaw the construction of the detector and we've finished taking data and we're doing lots of analyses on that data to try and understand neutrinos better. So that's one of them. The T2K experiment is an experiment that's running now. And I just got to join that experiment a year ago when I joined New York. And that experiment is measuring how neutrinos can change flavor from one kind to another as they travel from um, a, a laboratory on the east coast of Japan towards a fantastic neutrino detector on the west coast of, well, underneath a mountain near the west coast of Japan. So that's looking at how neutrinos change over time. And they have really exciting measurements there and a huge data set that I now have the opportunity to, to analyze. And then the last experiment, Dune, is one that is still being planned and being built. And it will start operating much later, late, later in this decade. So I'm, I'm helping plan that experiment, um, but we haven't started taking data yet. And that's gonna make really precise measurements of how neutrinos change over time. So very I don't have a favorite is all I'm saying. Um, actually, very interesting. Um, now, I understand that you're very much involved with Fermilab. Mm -hmm. um, so Abada will ask you a question on this topic. Um, so yeah, about Fermilab in particular, can you tell us more about your time and what you do there? Uh, what does it sound like when a neutrino beam is created? Ah, well, so actually when I, uh, so I actually worked at Fermilab for almost 20 years before coming to York. So when, and when I started at Fermilab, I started by working on the neutrino beam that they were building at the time. So Fermilab has produced the world's most intense neutrino beam. 
And in fact, Fermilab is home to two different neutrino beams now, and they're planning a third one that will run, you can't run all three at once, but you can, uh, they're, they're planning this third one that's gonna to point towards uh, South Dakota. But the, the thing about neutrinos is that in order to make a beam of neutrinos, you have to start with an accelerator, accelerate as many protons as you possibly can towards a target that makes charged particles that decay weakly. And those par charged particles, when they decay, decay into neutrinos. And so the thing that's tricky is you have to make a very special magnetic field to focus those charged particles before they decay. And the things that make that magnetic field are called, are called horns. And they're those funny shapes that you saw in that slide that um, they, uh, and the thing is that because they are uh, parabolic, they have this, these very long uh, aluminum kind of cones, that they're parabolic cones, but when you pulse them, the thing that's amazing to me is that they are pulsed with 200,000 amps. So there's a pulse every two seconds or 1.3 seconds, whatever the, your accelerator can do. Um, every, you know, three seconds or whatever it is that 100, that 200,000 amps go, you know, sailing through this magnet. And so the sound of a neutrino beam being made is the sound of these magnets pulsing. So there's actually a, a recording of that that you can hear. Uh, yes, I have that ready and queued up now. Um, I'll just go ahead and uh, go ahead and click play. So please do not be alarmed, uh, people in on YouTube. Uh, this is this is the sound you're supposed to hear. I can, I can explain those two different sounds. In fact, the, the joke was that that's a horn symphony because there's one sound that's like every two seconds, boom. That's the sound of the horn, the horn that is making the beam that was um, feeding the Minerva experiment. It's called the Numi beam. And those are, that horn, you can see pictures. The whole thing was like three meters long. And this is just, um, Chris Anderson sits next to some of these, some of these, these conductors that form this magnetic field. And then the other one was da, 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 da. that's another horn that was pulsing at 15 Hertz. And that was actually a test of the horns that are being used for the, the horn that's being used for the second neutrino beam that Fermilab is operating right now. That's incredible. Now, um, Shannon would like to go more in depth about some of the experiments you took part in. How about Takai to Kamioka? Uh, could you explain to our viewers what neutrino oscillations are? Sure. So neutrino oscillations are what happens when you have neutrinos that don't weigh exactly zero. So the idea is that um, we know that there are three different generations of neutrinos. And so uh, that means that um, but we also know that there are, so that means that neutrinos can have um, at least three different masses. And people have been studying the, um, the, you know, people have been studying neutrinos from the atmosphere, neutrinos from the sun for a very long time. And they were seeing all these strange, uh, this, these strange results, which implied that neutrinos actually were changing over time. And so, T2K is an experiment like the one, like ones that are running also at Fermilab, where you start with an accelerator and you make a beam of neutrinos so you can understand them very well. And when you use an accelerator to make a beam of neutrinos, it's mostly this muon flavored neutrino. And if you put a detector far away and a detector close by and you use the near detector to predict what you should see at the far detector, you can see, and T2K has seen this, um, that these muon neutrinos are actually changing. Most of the time, they're actually changing to tau neutrinos by the time they get to um, the west coast of Japan. But actually, some of them have changed into electron neutrinos. And that's really uh, was very exciting when we were able to build accelerator beams that were intense enough that, and, and we could see that that was actually happening. That means that we, are, we know now that neutrinos are changing between all these different flavors. And that means that neutrinos 
are um, weigh something. They don't weigh just. They don't all weigh the same amount, and they weigh and they weigh something. So that's that was huge, and it's not predicted by the theories at all. And how much they change was also not predicted. So um, so anyway, that's what so took. So the T2K experiment is running right now, and in fact, the the pictures in the slide that um, were up that was up is um, it's a detector technology that is completely different from the three different detector technologies I already showed you earlier. So if there's time at the end, somebody can ask me, how on earth can a tank full of water that has these funny glass bulbs uh, looking at the water, how can this possibly detect neutrino interactions? But I'll save that as a bonus at the end. All right, that sounds great. Let's go ahead and move to our next question. Um, uh, and uh, for the keen eyed amongst you, uh, when we do zoom in on uh, uh, Professor Harris's background, you can actually see behind her is an image of, um, of something rather famous. All right, let's go ahead and um, go to our next question, Quentin. Yes, I'd like to ask a little bit more about Dune. I understand that this experiment will fire the neutrinos at a tank of liquid argon. Uh, could you explain why that is? Sure. So liquid argon is the um, is the detector they've chosen because liquid argon can see these higher energy neutrinos at with a huge amount of detail and can measure the the particles that come out of a neutrino interaction very precisely. Yet Argon is cheap enough that you can make an enormous detector and put it far away and use it to measure neutrinos after they've covered some distance. So the way this detector works is that if you have a large electric field in this tank of liquid argon and you have a neutrino hitting the argon and making these charged particles that come out of the nucleus, those charged particles will go sailing through the argon and lose energy as they sail through the argon. The way they lose energy is that they ionize the argon. And so you have this, um, these particles are ionizing the argon in a big electric field. And so those um, electrons that are freed from the ionization drift in the direction of the electric field. And when they drift, that induces a signal on wires that are part of the detector. So what's really amazing about this detector is that you just, all you need to do is you need to create, you know, you have this enormous cryostat of liquid argon that has to be very pure, and you put in a very large electric field, and then you just put planes of wires along one side, and then the electrons drift toward the wires, and that gives you this really precise picture of how the neutrino has broken apart a nucleus and has deposited its energy into that detector. Does the decision to use argon, uh, is that related to its inertness or is, or is there another reason for that? Actually, there, it's kind of funny. So argon, it turns out is, so it's a noble gas, obviously, so or a noble element. So that means that you can make it um, very pure. You want the argon to be very pure because when you ionize these electrons, they have to drift a long way. If there are impurities, those will gobble up the electrons and then you won't get signal. But the other thing is that argon is relatively cheap. And, and I remember going to a talk once and somebody said that the cost of liquid argon is about the same per unit volume as the cost of like a craft beer. So, so anyway, that's why we use argon. It's basically a byproduct when people try to freeze um, when people try to make liquid nitrogen, which you know the fast food industry needs to freeze food, liquid argon is a byproduct of that because the argon freezes out for liquefies first. So argon is relatively cheap, and you can make it super pure. That's why it makes it's a great material to use for a detector. That is really really interesting. Thank you, uh, Obata. I believe you have the next question. Uh, yes, so about your second experiment, could you tell us more about Minerva and how the results are being used by oscillation experiments? Okay, sure. So um, I actually lied when I said that you can see a neutrino's energy by seeing the particles that get created when they interact in the argon, right? What you want to do is you want to measure 
the neutrino energies so that you can measure oscillations. The whole thing about oscillations is that neutrinos are changing versus time. And the way you measure how much time has elapsed for a neutrino between when you made it, let's say at Fermilab, and when you detected it, like at South Dakota, the way you figure out how much time has elapsed to that neutrino, you need to know the neutrino's energy. So in order to know the neutrino's energy, the only thing you can do is measure the particles that get created when the neutrino breaks apart a nucleus, right? So the problem is that we don't really know very well how a neutrino breaks apart a nucleus. The only th it's really complicated nuclear theory. We don't have a perfect model that explains everything. So we need to make measurements to understand what happens when neutrinos interact in a nucleus. What particles get made? How does the nuclear environment change the particles that get made in the first place? Maybe those particles lose energy as they leave the nucleus. So Minerva is an experiment that was designed to kind of write the book on how neutrinos interact in a nucleus. And we do that by trying to measure neutrino interactions on lots of different nuclei with the same neutrino beam. So we can do side-by-side -side comparisons of the same neutrino interaction and see how, you know, does it look different if it's in lead compared to if the neutrino interacted in carbon or in iron. And so that's what, that's what we did. And, and that's what we're still doing now. Like I said, we finished taking data, but now we're, we're analyzing that data to better understand all the different ways that neutrinos can interact in, in a nucleus. Wow, that's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, if that's all, I believe we're out of time for today. Thank you for taking the time to answer some of our questions. Oh, thank you so much for, for your interest. I appreciate it. Again, it's really great to have you here. And I'll just uh, hop over to chat to see if there's any live questions coming in. Uh, one of the questions from, uh, from chat is actually about the image behind you. <laughs> um, there was a guess for Sudbury detector. Um, can you tell us exactly what that image is? So this is um, an image taken from the sky of the Fermilab accelerator complex. And so the, I'm not sure if you can see how this works, but if you can see me pointing to that uh, building, there's a, that is a 16 story tall building in the middle of the prairie um, where all the offices are. And there are these two large circles. So the, and actually they're small circles. So, the, the way Fermilab accelerates protons is it starts, is it goes through a chain of accelerators and each accelerator sort of increases the protons energy by roughly a factor of 10. So there are several smaller accelerators and then the protons get moved into this circle here, which is the main injector. And that main injector accelerates the, the protons up to 120 times the rest mass of a proton. And so that's a really high energy proton, which makes a lot of charged particles at once that decay into neutrinos. So that's how Fermilab can make such a, an incredibly new, intense neutrino beam is it because it accelerates these protons to 120 GeV in this ring and then smashes them against a target. And then there are detectors way over, I was trying to figure this out before we started, uh, roughly there, but deep underground and those detectors are measuring the neutrino beam as it goes through the earth. And there's another um, detector up in Northern Minnesota, the NOVA experiment, which is also running, measuring neutrinos over time, but they're looking at higher energy neutrinos than T2K and uh, lower energy neutrinos than Dune's going to look at, but they also have exciting results. And, um, but anyway, so Fermilab is all of that and a lot more. Um, this other ring here, is the ring that used to that housed the the Tevatron, which is an accelerator that took protons up to 800 times their rest mass, which was used for a whole other set of nutrient of experiments that hopefully um, you may have heard about at, at previous. Uh, Oh, yeah. Uh, well, and a lot of these have made the news because of the, the wonderful applications and the, the interesting questions we think they might answer. And just for any physics students in the audience, um, if you want to look at uh, uses for high magnetic fields, um, I believe you could look into some of the engineering there. 
But uh, what might be nice is uh, we actually have a question from earlier that uh, gives a little bit of a scale of um, just how uh, hard these things are to see. A few people asked what percent of the neutrinos are blocked by the moon? Um, and I think maybe that was a, it's not a big percent, is it? No, it's, it's a very small percent. You have to run uh, for a long time to, to see the fact that you have this, this moon shadow. Uh, so I don't know that number off the top of my head. I'm sorry if you gave me a minute and a piece of paper and pencil. And oh, no, no, it's a little reminded me of the, mass of the moon, but, but <laughs> very few. Um, I mean, I can tell you that for the neutrino. Yeah, I can't tell you. I mean, it's less than one in a million. Um, yeah. But. So small, small, and this is something else that I think is good to to note. Uh, a couple people asked about the size of these particles. They're so unimaginably, mind-bogglingly small. It's um, it really is quite extraordinary. Uh, is there is there anything that you like to compare these two in terms of size? Uh, not really, because like some people ask me, well, are neutrinos smaller than electrons, and we haven't been able to measure the size of an electron either. So, so you know, again, I, I'm an experimentalist. So if we haven't measured it, I don't know what the answer is. So um, it's hard to imagine that, um, that, you know, I can't imagine that a, an electron is smaller than a neutrino, but they both have, um, you know, sizes that are too small for us to actually measure, at least with the technology we know about today. So we, basically call them point particles because, because we can't measure the extent to which that they cover. Exactly, and that is, that is something to keep in mind when you're looking at these itty bitty tiny subatomic uh, things. They're so small that we, we actually don't have a way of, of being able to see them at the moment. You get into problems with, with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle with some of our viewers might have might have heard about. Um, it's, it's, it, it is, it, if you've ever had a chance to watch one of the animations for um, zooming out from the solar system to this imaginary scale of the whole universe, if you go in the other direction, that's how you get to subatomic particles. Um, and it's, it really is uh, outside of our, our realm of, of knowledge as ordinary humans. So it's quite extraordinary that we have built devices to detect these or you have built, I should say. <laughs> so, um, and uh, let's just go ahead and um, uh, I think that's most of the questions, um, questions from chat. Um, there are a little bit of, of talk about, um, you know, neutrinos uh, um, and their interactions. Do you, do you do anything with the neutrinos changing flavor? So the T2K experiment, the Tokai to Kamioka experiment, does measure how much neutrinos change flavor between to the Tokai laboratory, um, or sorry, the JPARC laboratory in Tokai to the and the Super Kamiokande detector, which is located under a mountain in Kamioka. So nobody wanted to know uh, how that detector can actually see. We do actually. Everybody knows that, all that is, I have saved time. That is our default last question. Oh, okay. so can you please, <laughs> Professor Harris, I would love to know. Can you please tell me about the, the detector? Sure. So, do you mind going back to the picture? Yep. Of, Here um, we go. So, we're going to go back uh, to the um, Tokai Kamioka, and I believe this had some of those images. These are three different images of a um, of the Super Kamiokande detector. So it is an enormous tank full of water. So I was saying, oh, liquid argon is cheap because you know it's the same as craft beer. Well, this is water, <laughs> which is cheaper, of course, than than beer, but in most places. But um, you have to make the water incredibly pure. And what happens is if you make a charged particle, so you all have taken, uh, maybe, or most of you have taken um, a class where you learn that light travels slower in water than it travels in air, right? So there's this index of refraction that you know light slows down. But charged particles, if they are traveling faster than when they get produced, you know, they don't know 
that they're in water or whatever. So they will travel based on you know a certain speed based on how relativistic they are, how much energy they have when they get produced. So if you have a particle that is traveling through water faster than light can travel through water, then that particle will emit light. And that light is called Schrenkoff radiation and it has very specific properties. So these, what these little, these tubes are, these, these, these spheres that you see, each one is, I believe they're 20 inches. Um, so they, they're, you can't tell from the picture, but they're huge, you know, hand blown. And it's a device that takes light in and puts out an electronic signal. So you have a neutrino coming into the water. It makes charged particles. And if the charged particles are going fast enough, if they're energetic enough to be going more than the speed of light in water, then they make light. And these, these devices see that light, but the light comes out at a very specific angle. So by looking, you see these rings of light as your neutrino interaction. And that it, it's an incomplete picture of the whole interaction because you only see the particles that are above that threshold, but you see them very nicely, very beautifully. And you can tell very clearly an electron from a muon, for example. So that's how you instrument an enormous volume, an, an enormous mass of stuff <laughs> and, and, and make, make neutrino measurements out of it. So that's, that's how that works. It's all from particles going faster than the speed of light in water. And it is, um, it is absolutely wonderful if you can get some of these high resolution images and have a look. Um, we, are, we are not yeah. doing the scale of this justice, I have to say. Right. We, are, we are approaching the, the, the final end of our ability to, uh, to do questions, but there is one more very interesting one that's um, so, sort of one that comes up quite often in research and especially in physics, but uh, the the why is how is this useful to ordinary people question, uh, which I always think is a, a, a fun one. I know that uh, in neutrino research in particular, there's a lot of talk of um, using the the neutrino research that we're doing here, or you're doing in where you are, and um, you know using that knowledge to develop things like uh, more efficient. Uh, power plants. Um, there's actually ideas for for starting up, you know, theoretical um, matter antimatter power plants and hugely efficient energy production for humans on Earth. But it can be as simple as also, um, you know, using the technology that's developed to do the experiments for useful things. Um, Professor Harris, do you do you have any uh, any other extra things you might like to add on that subject? Yeah. Well, one thing that um, I think is, is sort of a, com, a, a practical, if you like, application of all the work we've done to develop neutrino detectors is this. So neutrinos interact almost never. So you have to be really, you know, you have to figure out the cheapest way to make the largest detector. That's basically what you figure out how to do. And so what you want, so there is a whole, you know, there are detectors that have been developed to see neutrinos that, um, are relatively cheap to make, and you can actually monitor nuclear reactors using those detectors. And so there's a whole program of work that is going on right now to, and of course, you know, neutrinos, you can't block out the neutrino beam coming from the reactor. So let's say there's a nuclear reactor going and somebody steals some weapons grade um, plutonium from the reactor your neutrino detector will see it. There's no way you can put out a shield to change the neutrino flux that comes from that reactor. And if you have enough detector sensitivity, you can see whether or not that, you know, some, some amount of the, um, the reactor fuel has been stolen. Wow. Oh, that is fascinating. So you can be a little bit of a, uh, um, you know, reactor uh, sort of fuel detective if you, if you right, wanted to right. be. And um, I should say it's called the Watchman collaboration that is. Oh, dear. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful.
All right. Well, I think that is, in fact, all we really, really have time for. Um, we will, a couple of us will stick by uh, for the next um, four or five minutes in chat. Um, as usual, you know, we try to try to end these programs relatively on time. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say a big thank you to Professor Harris for joining us and answering oh, all you. kinds of wonderful questions. Um, is there any final final thoughts you have? Me? Just uh, handing it back to you for oh, any. any no, I'm just grateful <laughs> for the interest, and it's and it's a, and it's a very exciting time to be working on uh, neutrino oscillations and and neutrino interactions both. Wonderful. Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, hand us off to Shannon for our outro. Thank you again, Professor Harris. This concludes our interview. Thank you all for tuning in. Well, everyone, you've been listening to the Alan I. Carswell Observatory's weekly Teletube broadcast, the astronomy and astrophysics program written and presented by the students, faculty, alumni, and friends of York University. The interviewers this, week, this evening have been Quentin, Obata, Professor Hyde, and myself, Shannon. Make sure to leave any comments or questions in the comment section of the video. You can always connect with us on Twitter with the handle at York Observatory and check out our website for show notes, content, updates, and contact info, observatory.info.yorku.ca. Thanks for tuning in. Clear skies and have a good night.